Hi, I'm Eric Boss, and Avengers Endgame released a new trailer. 30 whole seconds of footage. And to those who say that's hardly enough to talk about, you don't watch trailers the way I do. Like a paranoid shut-in who perceives this simulated reality in the language of Easter egg-shaped computer code. And you know, I think there's a lot more here than it seems. Mysterious inconsistencies, cryptic visual clues, something in Cap's mouth. Yeah, probably survivor's guilt. I'm gonna break down everything you might have missed frame by frame. And before we begin, thank you to our sponsor, Wix. Wix allows you to build your own professional website. We actually use Wix to build a fun interactive website for you guys to get more involved in our operation here. More details on that later. And spoiler warning in case any of this speculation ends up being right and ruins your precious life. Let's get started. Okay, this trailer opens with a super quick two second montage of Marvel heroes. And already there's a lot going on here. These are all heroes whom Thanos killed in Infinity War. And notice how they all specifically go pretty much in reverse order from the sequence we saw them dust. First, Wasp, Hope Van Dyne, among the most recent round of dusties in the post credit scene of Ant-Man and the Wasp. She's depicted here in the moment when Hank Pym first unveiled her Wasp suit in the post credit scene of the first Ant-Man movie. Second, Nick Fury, the last dusty in the final frame of the post credit scene after Infinity War. Oh, wait, was that the last time? Last time. Right, thanks. This shot is Fury stepping off the chopper to check in on the Tesseract in the opening scene of the first Avengers movie. Next is Spider-Man, the final Avenger to dust during Infinity War. This shot is during Spider-Man's awesome MCU debut in Civil War, the moment he snatched Cap's shield. Right before Peter's dusting in Infinity War was Doctor Strange, so he's next in this sequence. And this shot is from the scene in the Doctor Strange movie when he suits up with the Cloak of Levitation. Now, next in the order would be the Guardians on Titan, Starler, Drax, and Mantis, but here the trailer kind of groups them with Groot later. So next we get Falcon, depicted right after his cool barrel roll move in Lagos in Civil War. Then Scarlet Witch, who dusted right before Falcon did. Here she's defending Vision against Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight in the Edinburgh train station in Infinity War. And then we get the Guardians of the Galaxy. No Mantis, but Gamora is here. This is from the moment they escaped the Kiln prison in the first Guardians movie. And right before Groot dusted in Infinity War, it was T'Challa. So He's next. Here we see him in the Black Panther movie, the moment he was flanked by the door Milaje as he makes his way into Shuri's lab. And before T'Challa dusted, the first victim we saw, of course, was Bucky, whom we see next, the shot from Winter Soldier, when he caught Cap's shield. And finally, there's Vision, whom Thanos killed right before the snap. His shot here is from the end of Age of Ultron, right before his final confrontation with Ultron in Sokovia. And obviously, they made all of these shots monochromatic, but leaving the bright color red in each frame. This matches the color palette of the Marvel Studios' 10 title card, but it also gives some poignancy to each of these deaths. It's like red reflects the blood that was spilt as each of these people faded into neutral colored dust. It also reminds me of the famous use of the color red by Steven Spielberg in Schindler's List, the girl in the red coat during the ghetto massacre sequence. In that movie, this one splash of red in a world of black and white served as a microcosm of the widespread genocide. And maybe this moment is making a similar statement about the genocide that these characters are victims of. And if I haven't already overanalyzed this enough, we should point out that red is also the color of the reality stone. I just mentioned this because one popular theory out there is that maybe these characters aren't dead. Like maybe they were just separated into another reality where these guys are still alive and the survivors of Infinity War are the ones who are dead. And maybe the red reality stone is a key to unlocking the door to that parallel reality? Eh, I'll let you chew on that as we move on to some actual footage from this movie. And boy is it bleak. The fog that has settled over New York City makes it look as though the city skyline is in the process of dusting away as well. There's a grim shot of the Statue of Liberty with hundreds of boats docked around Liberty Island. Now, normally Liberty Island has just two piers to ferry tourists and staff to and from the island. Maybe all of these boats are like ghost ships with each of their crews having dusted away while they're on the water and then they drifted ashore to the island. Or maybe all these boats were part of a search and rescue operation for people looking for others who are stranded overseas. Whatever this is, it tells us that a good amount of time has passed, at least a few months since uh, Decimation. And uh, by the way, Decimation is the official name of the dusting, the snapping, the snapshot, whatever you want to call it. Even though technically Decimation refers to 10% being affected. And Thanos, of course, wiped out 50% of living creatures. But it's interesting to see the consequences of this on the Marvel world here. I hope the movie spends a lot of time in this post-apocalyptic land.
landscape. Actually, in another video, I explored the real world effects that Thanos' snap would have had on our society and infrastructure. Definitely go check that out. But I should remind you all that 50% isn't 50% uniformly everywhere. Like it doesn't mean that exactly half of every city, half of every country, half of every planet is gone. Like Thanos' snap was supposedly random and billions of coin flips would theoretically adhere to the law of averages, but you could possibly end up with like 90% of New Yorkers dusting and every single resident of Florida surviving unaffected. Look, my home state just finds a way to ruin everything. We also see City Field, home of the Mets. City Field is a dark pit of despair and it also looks pretty sad in this trailer. But notice those cars in the parking lot. You can see how the traffic wedged up as people panicked and fled, perhaps trying to get home to check on loved ones or to try to get to a dry cleaner to get Mickey Calloway's dust out of their clothes. I've been talking a lot, so let's be one of those people that moves on that Cap talks about. Move on. Bananas. Okay, so after City Field, we move on to this group therapy session. Another example of the way society has been affected by the snap. There's a poster advertising this therapy with the slogan, where do we go now that they're gone? The idea that people are doing this reminds me a lot of the world of The Leftovers, the HBO series and the novel, which was set in the aftermath of a similar rapture style event that caused 2% of the world's population to disappear. Many of the characters took part in similar therapy programs and in some cases, bizarre self therapy and cult communities. It'll be interesting to see if Endgame explores those consequences. But notice how this poster features a solitary figure with a row of shadows of absent figures. Maybe it's just me, but for me, these kind of evoke those eerie nuclear shadows that were imprinted on surfaces after the atomic explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It became haunting memories of the victims who were caught in these blast waves. Similarly, the victims of Thanos' snap decimation leave nothing behind but a shadows, a pile of dust and residue. Now, this facility looks like a VFW hall and and Cap joining this session could be a nod to the group therapy sessions that Sam used to run for vets and Winter Soldier. Cap definitely appears to be biting his tongue here, bottling up an anger and restlessness that he can't quite express this way. He doesn't want to move on because he probably still feels like he has blood on his hands. And the voiceover here expresses his thoughts exactly. Some people move on, but not us. Now, I guess we're meant to assume that this is Cap's voice, but if you listen closely, only part of it really sounds like him. The first part sounds to me more like Tony Stark. Some People move on, but not us. Yeah, maybe I'm hearing things. Maybe this audio is just for a promo and won't be in the final movie. Or maybe this is from a scene when Cap and Stark reunite and we see a way that might happen in the next shot. Tony and Nebula, previously shown stranded adrift on the Guardian ship, the Benatar, now science seeing the shit out of this. It looks like Tony Stark has gone full circle. Remember in the first Iron Man, he rescued himself from captivity by engineering a solution, building a suit in a cave with a box of scraps. And now the box of scraps is named Nebula. Check it out, she appears to be prying apart her mechanical hand, perhaps lending Tony a literal hand as he repairs the ship. This would be a nice callback to how Thanos dismissed Nebula in Infinity War. It would have been a waste of parts. Yeah, here's a good use of parts, you dick. The most interesting thing to me about this shot is Tony. Look at the arc reactor in his chest. In Infinity War, his new nanotech armor appeared to be part of, or maybe on top of his clothes. But now the arc reactor definitely glows from under his shirt. It looks like it's once again embedded in his chest. Does this mean Tony Stark has re-implanted his reactor in his body? Did he do this maybe to boost his vitals so that he can survive this long in space? Either way, with the reactor back inside his flesh, it really does bring him back full circle to the cave. And before I move on, well, not emotionally, it's impossible to move on emotionally for me. There's this shot of Cap, Natasha, Banner, and Rhodey outside Avengers HQ looking upward at something. Now, I'm not that great at reading faces according to various specialists and online tests, but I would describe their looks as concerned or confused or surprised? What is making them feel these feels? Well, we know that Thor and Rocket are among the heroes left on Earth, so maybe one of them is taking off in the middle of the night to try to find Thanos, go off on his own, or maybe they're just you know sick of sitting around, moping, or maybe these four are walking up to the arrival of someone or something, like maybe Stark and Nebula returning to Earth on the Benatar, or maybe Captain Marvel arriving, or maybe one of the many cosmic entities that we've speculated might engage in some kind of divine intervention with 
the Avengers? Characters like the Living Tribunal or Eternity or Kronos? Now, judging from their clothes, this shot is taking place around the same time Cap and Natasha saw that video feed of Scott Lang at the front gate. Maybe they're walking out to the gate to greet Scott so that they can find out where the hell he's been or when the hell he's been. <laughs> Check out my earlier breakdown for my theory of how time travel could play a role in this. And there might be something else that we missed in this shot, but I want to talk more about that later. For now, on to the next clip. Not us. Okay, so this last section begins with a quick shot of Rocket coming through a door. Now, a few things here. First, look at his outfit. Rocket's new clothes are the blue buttoned jumpsuit that he wears in the 2008 Guardians of the Galaxy comics, the ones by Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning. But more importantly, some clues in the background might tell us where he is. There's a rocky coastline and some lobster traps lying around. To me, this suggests this is somewhere in the Northern Atlantic, my guess, Norway. The reason I think that is there's another shot in this section showing Thor in some structure facing some steep green hills. Some have suggested he could be on Titan II, the planet Thanos is on at the end of Infinity War, maybe in or near Thanos' farmhouse, or maybe Thor is in Wakanda. But I think Rocket and Thor are in the same place and that Thor has exiled himself somewhere on this Norwegian coast because that is the homeland of Norse mythology and it's the location where his father Odin died. And maybe here, Rocket has tracked down Thor to beg him to come back. Or maybe Odin's son and Rabbit are staying teamed up after Infinity War to search for Thanos on their own because they're stubborn and they refuse to give up. So the two of them shack up in this lobster hut in Norway. We also see Natasha venting some steam on a firing range in Avengers HQ. On the right, you can see she's already shredded through the bullseye on one of them and she's working her way down. But notice how her hair is tied in a braid and it's much longer than the length that we saw in other shots. For it to grow from that to this, it would take at least six months, according to my girlfriend who knows more about these things than I do. Maybe longer than six months. Look, it is hard to gauge the timeline here, but for Liberty Island to turn into a shipyard, for post-snap support groups to start up, and Black Widow to grow a braid, I think there's a good chance we'll see some time jump, maybe six months later. But again, if time travel or parallel timeline jumping comes into play in this movie, hair length might not indicate anything. There's also this shot of Ant-Man and Rhodey suiting up in Avengers HQ. So this tells us that Scott will end up with them in the present, regardless of whether or not the video feed was archive footage, but also that some kind of action will heat up right from the Avengers home base. Also, this looks like new War Machine armor. Remember, Thanos disabled the armor that Rhodey used in Infinity War, and while he could still walk around in it, it wouldn't be an effective weapon unless Banner or Rocket helped him repair it, or unless Stark left behind an upgrade for him. This could also be how Pepper Potts gets a suit of armor, like the one that we've seen Gwyneth Paltrow wearing in set photos. We also briefly see Hawkeye. He looks like he's in some kind of crash site crater. Like you could see smoke and crumbling debris. Maybe the red light on his face is from a vessel that crashed there. Maybe it's whatever the other Avengers were looking up at in that other shot. Clint also appears to be feeling, uh, Feels. And next, there's this close-up of Cap tightening his shield. A few things here. First, Cap has his old shield back. Remember, he hasn't had it since his fight with Stark in Civil War, and even then, that was a newer upgrade with uh, magnetic controls, if I remember correctly, whereas this one looks to be the classic one with leather straps. In Spider-Man Homecoming, remember, Happy Hogan did mention Stark was working on a new shield for Cap, but this one doesn't look like a new prototype. It's a relic. We'll see, but this could be another clue pointing toward Cap going retro and fighting his old battle battles, maybe through some form of time travel, but notice his dirty, trembling hand. Very dramatic. This reminded me of another Spielberg shot, also of a World War II soldier, the recurring close-up in Saving Private Ryan, showing Tom Hanks's shaking hand. It was a way of expressing the character's humanity, despite his steady, outward demeanor. So I'm guessing that this shot could be from Cap's final bout with Thanos, perhaps something like the face-to-face -face fight that they went through in the Infinity Gauntlet comics. And next, we get a very interesting shot of the heroes marching through Avengers HQ as a sun rises, there's Cap, Thor, Black Widow, Rocket, Ant-Man, War Machine, and right behind Rhodey, Banner. But what's weird to me is that we already saw this same shot, same framing and everything in the last trailer, except the room was empty. So why would they shoot the same shot twice 
once with actors and once without. It could be a lot of reasons, but I have two theories. First, maybe this is just one of many examples of footage shown in a trailer that ends up getting re-edited or dropped in the final cut of the movie. Like that one big Avengers Assemble shot from the Infinity War trailer that was never in the movie at all. Like they might have a lot of versions of this shot because they have a lot of CGI to do on it. Like obviously Rocket had to be CGI inserted. But notice that gap in the line between Scott and Rhodey. Will the Russos later digitally insert another character in there? Like maybe Hawkeye? And coming back to that shot on the lawn earlier, notice the empty space between Banner and Rhodey. Does Rhodey just not like walking next to other people? I mean, sure, sometimes you just gotta walk off a fart, right? Or maybe the Avengers plan to insert Hawkeye or another character like Captain Marvel or Pepper Potts in rescue armor or some other new character, some of the spoilery in those empty spaces in the final cut. Okay, so that's theory one. Theory two is that this dolly shot is telling more of a story than we realize. Look at the position of the sun. It's a bit higher in the first trailer shot, the one without people in it. And that shot is also moving to the left, as opposed to this one, which is moving right. Could the different positions of the sun in the different camera movements be important clues here? Look, there's been a lot of evidence pointing to some kind of cosmic displacement for these heroes, like traveling back in time, traveling to a parallel reality, traveling somewhere. This displacement could be connected to the devices that we've seen on the Avengers' hands and set photos. Imagine that these two sunrise shots are actually part of the same moment. The camera follows the Avengers as they march across the room, right as the sun rises, and then they disappear or displace back in time into another reality somewhere. And then as they disappear, the camera dollies back across the now empty room. And then after their displacement, they march back into this moment at the end of their journey. Maybe different characters are with them. It would be like if you're in Back to the Future and you're just another character standing in the Twin Pines Mall parking lot and you see Marty McFly drive the DeLorean out of 1985, disappear into the past, and then moments later, he returns back from the past. And he does that random roll down the bushes. Like I know, this is a theory. And to be honest, I'm really just leaning toward this being part of the abundance of excess footage that the Russo shot for the movie and used just for the trailers, won't be in the movie, and that's why there are these duplicate versions. But I'll give you one last possible clue. Listen to what we hear during this shot. Not us. Now this is kind of weird, because we already heard Cap say, not us, earlier in the trailer. Some people move on, but not us. So why would Cap say, not us, twice? For dramatic effect? Like Switch's final words in The Matrix? Not like this. Not like this. Yeah, dramatic effect. Possibly. Probably. But listen again to the two back to back. They're different. But not us. Not us. Yeah, see, the second not us has gotta be more than just an echo. Like it sounds deeper, more of a growl. Some are saying it kinda sounds like Ultron. Now, I don't know about that, but maybe the reason we hear two not uses is that they're coming from two caps. One present, one past. Or one in reality A, one in reality B. Like I know I'm reaching here. That's kinda my job, because sometimes these big theory swings get you a dinger all the way to the empty bleachers of City Field. Here's what I wanna know from you. If those empty spaces are going to be filled by a mystery character, who do you want it to be? And which of these shots do you think could end up just being a trailer only footage for this promo? Comment down below with your thoughts and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EA Voss and subscribe to this channel and subscribe to our new podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And little plug here, if you live in the LA area, come meet me every first Friday of the month at the Acme Theater in North Hollywood for my live comedy show, Darkest Timeline Comedy. And again, big thanks to our sponsor, Wix. Wix allows you to build a professional website with thousands of easy to use templates that set you up with a site for whatever you need it to be. Look, every functioning adult needs a legit place for people to find them online with a platform that you control that does what you need it to do. A blog, a business, a place to show off your projects. New rock stars actually use Wix to build a website of our own. You can go check it out. Thanks to Wix, we now have one place where you have a direct line to us to give us feedback and help us decide what kinds of videos to make. All in a way that we can actually hear and you don't get buried in tweets and comment sections. And we've actually started using this feedback that you've given us through this Wix site to decide what type of videos to make in 2019 so you can help us keep this discussion going. When it comes to design, Wix gives you infinite possibilities to make your website your own unique masterpiece. But Wix takes care of all the heavy lifting. Your site will be safe, secure, and you don't have to worry about weird glitches that could have come up if you tried to build a site without someone helping you. Wix has a solution for every need with features like Wix blog, Wix video, Wix stores, Wix booking. Really, anything you need a website to improve your life, Wix has you covered. Build your own website today by going to wix.com 
slash go slash new rock stars or by using our link in the description below. Thank you for watching. Shout out to my buddy Alex Anoho. And hey, we still got a couple months, plenty of time to digitally insert this guy next to the Avengers. I'm told I'm great at expressing ambiguous emotion. Oh, look guys, a thing. I feels, fe feelings.